This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a travel agent and a customer who needs to book a hotel for a group visit. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello Elite Travel, this is Emily speaking. How may I assist you today? Hi, I have a group visit to plan and I wonder whether you could help me decide on which hotel to book. I've narrowed it down to either the Winchester, the Royal Hotel, or the Star Hotel. I'm wondering if you have a recommendation. I would be happy to help. Those three are excellent choices. If everyone is booking hotel rooms independently, an easy way to do it is online booking. The Star Hotel offers online bookings at no additional charge. It sounds fine. Yeah, and you can even book the gorgeous Sea View rooms if you act quickly. I'll consider that. It would be great since we're mostly first-time visitors to the area to get a nice view of the water. Now, are there handicap accessible rooms? Yes, all three options have access for the physically disabled. Great. I should also mention that we'll be on a tight schedule, so we won't have much time to go out for meals. Which of these hotels serve food? There is a limited continental breakfast menu at the Star and at the Winchester. For a full restaurant and room service, the Royal Hotel is your best bet. Oh, wonderful. Could you tell me more about the restaurant? Absolutely. In the morning, there is a gourmet buffet, or a la carte item, and after 11 a.m., lunch is served in the dining room. Dinners are in a nice, low-key, but high-quality setting in the hotel's private dining room and Fridays feature the house jazz band. How lovely! Is there a group discount? No, sorry, not at the Royal Hotel. Let me check on the others, though. Could I place you on hold for just a second? Sure, thanks. It looks like there is one at the Winchester. 15% off when you book eight or more rooms. Really? Sold. We'll book at the Winchester. Wait, is it suitable for children, though? We'll have a few little ones in our group, and it would be great to have a way to keep them occupied. Yes, in fact, it has a play place that kids just love, with slides and swings and everything. Definitely a good hotel to bring the kids. Okay, great. 
before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So now I know where we'll be staying. What next? Should I go ahead and book transportation and assign rooms and everything? Well, for now there are only a few things for you to take care of. We will hold a block of rooms for you as soon as you send a deposit. I recommend booking as soon as possible, so you probably want to send the invitations as soon as you know how many rooms to hold. All right. OK. I'll send the invitations and put down the deposit. Is there anything else I should take care of? Great. And don't worry about this now. But sometime before you arrive, do let us know if you'll be requiring our transport service to and from the airport. I'll make sure to let you know. Does that incur a service charge? Or perhaps a tip? Or some presents to show our gratitude for the personal car service? Oh, don't worry about it. It is a free service, so if you would like to tip, you are welcome to do so. But hotel drivers do not accept gifts. Thanks for your help. My pleasure. Enjoy your stay at the Winchester. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a woman called Alice Bussell talking on the radio about the Dolphin Conservation Trust, an organisation which tries to protect dolphins. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Today we're pleased to have on the show Alice Bussell from the Dolphin Conservation Trust. Tell us about the trust, Alice. Well, obviously its purpose is to protect dolphins in seas all around the world. It tries to raise people's awareness of the problems these marine creatures are suffering because of pollution and other threats. It started 10 years ago and it's one of the fastest growing animal charities in the country, although it's still fairly small compared with the big players in animal protection. We're particularly proud of the work we do in education. Last year we visited a huge number of schools in different parts of the country, going round to talk to children and young people aged from 5 to 18. In fact, about 35% of our members are children. Oh. 
The charity uses its money to support campaigns, for example, for changes in fishing policy and so forth. Mm. It hopes soon to be able to employ its first full-time biologist with dolphin expertise to monitor populations. Of course, many people give their services on a voluntary basis, and we now have volunteers working in observation, office work and other things. I should also tell you about the award we won from the Charity Commission last year for our work in education. Although it's not meant an enormous amount of money for us, it has made our activities even more widely publicised and understood. In the long term, it may not bring in extra members, but we're hoping it'll have this effect. Is it possible to see dolphins in UK waters? Yes, in several locations. And we have a big project in the east part of Scotland. This has long been a haven for dolphins because it has very little shipping. Oh. However, that may be about to change soon because oil companies want to increase exploration there. Mm. We're campaigning against this because although there'll be little pollution from oil, exploration creates a lot of underwater noise. It means the dolphins can't rest and socialise. <laughs> this is how I became interested in dolphin conservation in the first place. I had never seen one and I hadn't been particularly interested in them at school. Then I came across this story about a family of dolphins who had to leave their home in the Moray Firth because of the oil companies and about a child who campaigned to save them. I couldn't put the book down. <laughs> I was hooked. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. I'm sure our listeners will want to find out what they can do to help. You mentioned the Adopt-a-Dolphin scheme. Can you tell us about that? Of course. People can choose one of our dolphins to sponsor. They receive a picture of it and news updates. I'd like to tell you about four which are currently being adopted by our members. Moondancer, Echo, Kiwi and Samson. <laughs> Unfortunately, Echo is being rather elusive this year and hasn't yet been sighted by our observers, but we remain optimistic that he'll be out there soon. All the others have been out in force. Samson and Moondancer are often photographed together, but it's Kiwi who's our real character, as she seems to love coming up close for the cameras, <laughs> and we've captured her on film hundreds of times. They all have their own personalities. Moon Dancer is very elegant and curves out and into the water very smoothly, whereas Samson has a lot of energy. He's always leaping out of the water with great vigour. You'd probably expect him to be the youngest. He's not quite. That's Kiwi. But Samson's the latest of our dolphins to be chosen for the scheme. Kiwi makes a lot of noise, so we can often pick her out straight away. <laughs> Echo and Moondancer are noisy too, but Moondancer's easy to find because she has a particularly large fin on her back, which makes her easy to identify. So, yes, they're all very different. Well, they sound a fascinating group. And how would you go about... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3.
you will hear a student asking Professor Jamieson for advice in choosing courses for next semester. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Hi, Professor Jameson. I was hoping we could talk this week about choosing courses for next semester. That sounds great. Any idea yet or what you'd like to take? Well, I was hoping you could kind of tell me. There are so many to choose from. I don't even know where to start. Sure. Well, first things first. Do you know what you will major in? It's important to take courses that are relevant to your career path. Well, I think I want to major in biology. I want to go to medical school, so it seems like it would make sense. I agree. If you like biology, it's definitely a good idea to focus on that, since so many of the requirements overlap. OK, so I should take a few biology classes then? Yes, let's start there. You should pick one or two biology classes. Not just any biology classes, though. If possible, read online or talk to senior fellows and find out about the structure of the courses. You don't want to end up signing up for two classes that require labs in the same semester. You'll spend so much time in the biology department that you won't see the light of day. All right, good idea. I heard labs can be as long as four hours. That's true. And another thing, make sure the topic is either relevant to your major or something you're interested in learning about. It sounds obvious, but do not just take a class because you heard it was easy or because it does not require attendance. Of course not, though it would be really nice to have at least one class that's a little bit less rigorous than the ones I'm taking this semester. I barely sleep as it is with all this studying. That may have more to do with your study habits, though I don't disagree that your schedule is really difficult this semester. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. So, any idea which biology classes you may decide on for next semester? Well, I was thinking of taking human physiology. It sounds relevant and interesting. I think it is an interesting class, but I would recommend against it. You're already in human anatomy, which also covers physiology so it would be repetitive and probably not the best use of your time. If I already know some of the stuff, I could take it to boost my GPA a little bit. Um, you could maybe do that, except the professor that teaches it is famous for giving out the fewest A's of any professor. Oh, well, never mind. Now, changing subjects. Have you decided yet on your research topic? Well, I, I actually decided I don't want to do a research paper. I'm going to do a dissertation instead. I think I will much more enjoy coming up with a thesis and finding all the details to support it. 
I see. Didn't you already do some of the research, though? What happened to that? Well, I started doing research. Then the more data I collected, the more complicated things got. I realized I would have to take a lot more steps to randomize the sample. And then I realized I would need to control for more factors. I see. What kind of data collection did you do? I interviewed employees at the water treatment facility after Professor Dickinson recommended it. I understand. Well, the research paper could be much more outside work, but it may be worth it if that is what you're interested in. No, I, I am a lot happier just doing the dissertation. That's fine with me. Just remember, you need to finish your first draft and send it in soon. It's already the middle of February. Oh, wow, it is, isn't it? I just have to finish it by the end of March, right? Yep, but don't forget, the date will really sneak up on you. Okay, I'll make sure to set reminders in my calendar. And who do I talk to about registering my dissertation? You should go to the department office and then talk to the secretary. I thought I needed to talk to the department head. Not for registering. If you need help developing your dissertation, that's when you should go to the department head. I see. And who would I see about getting access to the database of past research on my topic? That you can find in the computer lab, specifically in the office. You'll have to ask a lab technician to give you access. OK. Well, I'll go ahead and get started on that then. Thanks. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture on renewable energy that uses the power of the sea. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Producing enough energy to meet our needs has become a serious problem. Demand is rising rapidly because of the world's increasing population and expanding industry. Burning fossil fuels like gas, coal and oil seriously damages the environment and they'll eventually run out. For a number of years now, scientists have been working out how we can derive energy from renewable sources, such as the sun and wind, without causing pollution. Today, I'll outline marine renewable energy, also called ocean energy, which harnesses the movement of the oceans. Marine renewable energy can be divided into three main categories. Wave energy, tidal energy, and ocean thermal energy conversion. And I'll say a few words about each one. 
First, wave energy. Numerous devices have been invented to harvest wave energy with names such as Wave Dragon, the Penguin and Mighty Whale. And research is going on to try and come up with a really efficient method. This form of energy has plenty of potential as the source is constant and there's no danger of waves coming to a standstill. Electricity can be generated using onshore systems, using a reservoir or offshore systems. But the problem with ocean waves is that they're erratic, with the wind making them travel in every direction. This adds to the difficulty of creating efficient technology. Ideally, all the waves would travel smoothly and regularly along the same straight line. Another drawback is that sand and other sediment on the ocean floor might be stopped from flowing normally, which can lead to environmental problems. The second category of marine energy that I'll mention is tidal energy. One major advantage of using the tide rather than waves as a source of energy is that it's predictable. We know the exact times of high and low tides for years to come. For tidal energy to be effective, the difference between high and low tides needs to be at least five meters. And this occurs naturally in only about 40 places on Earth. But the right conditions can be created by constructing a tidal lagoon, an area of seawater separated from the sea. One current plan is to create a tidal lagoon on the coast of Wales. This will be an area of water within a bay at Swansea, sheltered by a U-shaped breakwater or dam built out from the coast. The breakwater will contain 16 hydro turbines, and as the tide rises, water rushes through the breakwater, activating the turbines, which turn a generator to produce electricity. Then, for three hours as the tide goes out, the water is held back within the breakwater, increasing the difference in water level until it's several meters higher within the lagoon than in the open sea. Then, in order to release the stored water, gates in the breakwater are opened. It pours powerfully out of the lagoon, driving the turbines in the breakwater in the opposite direction and again generating thousands of megawatts of electricity. As there are two high tides a day, this lagoon scheme would generate electricity four times a day, every day, for a total of around 14 hours in every 24, and enough electricity for over 150,000 homes. This system has quite a lot in its favour. Unlike solar and wind energy, it doesn't depend on the weather. The turbines are operated without the need for fuel, so it doesn't create any greenhouse gas emissions and very little maintenance is needed. It's estimated that electricity generated in this way will be relatively cheap and that manufacturing the components would create more than 2,000 jobs, a big boost to the local economy. On the other hand, there are fears that lagoons might harm both fish and birds, for example, by disturbing migration patterns and causing a buildup of silt affecting local ecosystems. There are other forms of tidal energy, but I'll go on to the third category of marine energy, ocean thermal energy conversion. This depends on there being a big difference in temperature between surface water and the water a couple of kilometers below the surface. And this occurs 
in tropical coastal areas. The idea is to bring cold water up to the surface using a submerged pipe. The concept dates back to 1881, when... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.